At the time of writing this video, Spotify has categorized 5,987 distinct genres of music, a number that has almost certainly increased by the time you're watching this now. Unless you can name all nearly 6,000 of them, there's a pretty good chance you're a fan of a genre you haven't even heard of. Perhaps you enjoy Gothabilly, Neurostep, or Black and Deathcore. You could be a listener of Baps, Bebop, or Funk. But the fact of the matter is that you don't really need to know exactly what kind of music you like, because Spotify already has you all figured out. Every week, for every user, they're able to tailor a 30-song playlist to that person's exact music tastes, ranging from the world's most popular artists to the most niche indie productions on the platform. But have you ever wondered how? I mean, you probably have because that's why you clicked on this video. So um, here's how. Spotify's recommendation system is composed of three different algorithms, which makes it three times better than one algorithm because of math. The first of these three actually has nothing to do with the music itself, and it's called collaborative filtering. This is basically the way that Netflix recommends new shows, by writing a 6,000 word end user license agreement that gives them permission to record everything you do until you die or throw your phone into a volcano. Located in Spotify's giant matrix room, pictured here, they've stored a giant matrix. It's roughly 433 million rows by 80 million columns, indexing every single user and every single song on the platform and recording how often each person listens to each song. This is simplifying things a bit, but this matrix allows them to objectively determine which users are most similar. If one row is hitting all the same columns as another row, that means those two people are listening to the same songs. And if one of those rows has an active column that the other doesn't have, then that song would, theoretically, be good to recommend. Basically what I'm saying is, if you want to ruin a specific person's Spotify, all you have to do is make a new account, listen to all their favorite songs, and then listen to Tornado Siren sound effects by Royalty Free Music and Sound Effect Factory 70,000 times. Now, Spotify can't rely entirely on collaborative filtering. It's not very accurate, especially when it comes to people's multifaceted music tastes, and it tends to just promote generally popular music while burying things that don't have a ton of listening data to work with, like the Sam from Wendover's Old Time Jamboree band, even if their music is hot fire. That's where the next algorithm comes in, Spotify's natural language processing system. You see, one of the best ways to categorize songs is with words, and it turns out that the internet has a whole bunch of them. Spotify is constantly gathering text associated with its songs. It'll look at text on its own platform, stuff like song titles, playlist descriptions, and lyrics, but it'll also pull data from the rest of the internet. Spotify scrapes song reviews, news articles, comment sections, you name it, and all this goes into building an associated word bank for each song and artist on its platform. Here's one such table generated by Echo Nest, the music data company that Spotify purchased in 2014 for the phrase ABBA. As you can see, it has the noun phrases most commonly associated with ABBA, as well as the adjectives most commonly used when describing ABBA. Using this table, you can intuit that ABBA fans will probably like other things that are frequently described with perky, nonviolent, and Swedish, such as Greta Thunberg or this stuffed shark that has its own subreddit for some reason. But at this point, you've probably noticed something weird. All of this data that Spotify is using, the adjectives, the song titles, the listening frequencies, none of it is gathered from the music itself. So that raises the question, can Spotify actually listen to its own music? And the answer, interestingly, is yes. This is where our third algorithm comes in, Spotify's sonic profiles. Sorry, Spotify's sonic profiles. Here's how they work. For each song on the platform, Spotify generates something called a time frequency representation, which looks something like this. This axis is time, this axis is frequency, and warmer colors mean louder decibel levels, so for example, at exactly 12 seconds into this song, these are the frequencies that are most present. This representation is then dumped into a neural network where these rectangles make the song smaller, and these rectangles are borderline sentient and their only purpose in life is to extract semantic data from your ex-boyfriend's mixtape. The neural network isolates all of the major features of the song, stuff like its key, tempo, timbre, loudness, and time signature, and compares these qualities individually against other songs you like and other songs you haven't heard. Then, in tandem with the collaborative filtering system and natural language processing algorithm, these sonic profiles are used to precisely hone in on songs that are acoustically similar enough to the kind of music you already listen to, while also experimenting with one or two variables to avoid presenting you with anything too stale. And there you go. That's how to spend $11 billion a year convincing people to not just listen to the same three Taylor Swift songs on repeat for the rest of their life. Now, while it might be worth shelling out 10 bucks a month for a robot to tell you what you like, I've got a better value proposition for you, and it's called Nebula. Three years ago, my friends and I got together and launched our very own streaming site to free us and other educational creators from the shackles of the YouTube algorithm. The results have been amazing. 
Nebula has paved the way for ambitious original content from creators you already know and love, like myself, Brian from Real Engineering, Real Life Lore, H Bomber Guy, Lindsay Ellis, and so many more. I'd recommend checking out one of our original documentaries, like The Colorado Problem or Alaska's Silent Summer. You might also enjoy Real Life Lore's Modern Conflict series, which does deep dives on modern conflicts like Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or Anita Sarkeesian's That Time When, which breaks down moments in history where politics and pop culture collided. But before you sign up for Nebula, let me sweeten the deal. The cheapest way to get Nebula is to sign up for the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle. It's only $14.79 for an entire year, and in addition to all the stuff I talked about on Nebula, you also get access to CuriosityStream's massive catalog of shows and documentaries. All you've got to do is sign up with our link, curiositystream.com/hai, and you'll be supporting all of our channels while you're at it.